So what I'm here to tell you about is the uh, reboot of Amiga under the, uh, after the gateway repurchase of all the Amiga technologies. And I'm going to sort of walk you through the very active process of building something that was somewhat different from the original Amiga, but still at the same time preserved uh, many of the characteristics. So my name is Alan Kapmos. I worked for Commodore Amiga between 1989 until the bitter end, as you heard about. I started out working two years out of the European headquarters. I was in charge of technical development support, very similar to CATS in the United States, and ultimately uh, moved to the United States and took up uh, Andy Finkel's job after he left. So I was in head of the R&D for the software. So what I'd like to do is to give you an idea of what happened in Gateway, what the thought process was, what we designed, what we built, and uh, how that all came about. So, this is actually a photo of the front door of our San Jose offices for the R&D facility. So let's try to remember what was it really in 1997-98. Uh, the internet boom was in full effect, cell phones were on an analog, and I actually found this old Nokia phone, which is the one I had at the time that was very sophisticated. No tablets, Linux was young, but uh, beginning to do useful things. And back in those days, set-top boxes was really the rage, along with home computers and what was called uh, internet information appliances. And as you'll see, that was really what we focused on. And from a VC perspective, if you could add .com to anything you did, you would get the funding out of the VC. So uh, we have figured that out too. So the backstory is that in about 1997, Gateway had bought uh, the patent portfolio of Amiga. And back then, this was really quite significant. It's easy to forget, but for instance, Amiga had a patent on the concept that if you click the right mouse button, the menu pops on. This was, so it's a fairly, there's a number of very, very significant patents that for Gateway was of extraordinary value. So they obviously played it smart, waited until the bankruptcy and all the grief had set in, and essentially picked the assets up very, very well. The interesting thing that happened, this took Gateway, Gateway completely by surprise. Moments after the purchase was announced, Amiga customers started calling Gateway. And they wanted to buy Amigas. This they had not expected. And uh, their founder, Ted Waite, very impressive uh, man, thought this was really sort of interesting. He had never really experienced a committed uh, customer base like that, simply calling out of the blue and wanting to buy stuff. So he got pretty excited. And uh, he decided, since Gateway was at that time in the mid 90s to late 90s, they're really known for the fastest, best product, but at very reasonable prices. And those of you who bought PCs in the late 90s most likely bought Gateways for that exact reason. So Gateways vision at the time was really, they wanted to be the hub of all entertainment in the house. They had already had a little set-top box, and their point was they wanted to be the center for movies, for videos, for games, for anything that they could think of. And Ted Wake thought that the Amiga based on the community almost entirely, had to be the perfect vehicle. You cannot find a more enthusiastic community that already understood video. And so he uh, tapped one of his friends, Jeff Timber, that I'll talk about later, to get this off the ground. And by happenstance, I got involved in 1997. It was entirely because my name was on some of the patents, so they just looked up who is it. And since my name is half most of so they wanted me in the US, and easy to find. So I think quite frankly, uh, that's how that happened. So what Gateway really wanted was something very simple. They wanted, and without it being very specific, they wanted a technology so that a person could work on any number of devices in the house and not be bound by the limits of the device. And I'll tell you how we went about doing that. So, and I, I, I'm just sort of setting the stage here, then I'll get into some of the details. One of the things about the Amiga that I personally found most impressive happens to be exactly the core operating system kernel. And what's really neat about it is not only is it squeaky clean, it's extremely tight, it's well-written, object-oriented, it's message-based, it has all the characteristics of what nowadays would be considered sound design, but back when it was designed was obviously revolutionary in a variety of ways. However, to get this off the ground, the thought process at the time was, well, this was great in a the task system of the Amiga, but if you were to make this truly networkable, the same ideas could apply. You wanted a message-based kernel, you wanted it to be fully threaded, you 
wanted to have applications and objects move freely across the network, and that's what we ended up doing. And so we started out, I actually wrote, I was employee number one for about six months, and I wrote the first couple of prototypes of it, and later hired employee two on the R&D team, which at Leipzig, you'll, you'll see the pictures of it. That was in the second. In the beginning, Gateway was a PC company, and as Petro Tatinko used to say when he was joking with me, it's a screwdriver company, meaning they assemble stuff. They don't design things. So from Gateway's perspective, it had to be sort of similar to a PC. That was their universe. This is how they thought. This is also where they had their purchasing power. Gateway was very significant in the late 90s. So we started out uh, with a PC base, and just we knew at some point it may be a different CPU, but quite frankly, Early on, none of that really made a difference. So anyone who's been in startup land knows what this is. This is pretty much the first day we moved in. Um, we haven't gotten our tables yet. We're sitting on the floors uh, coding. And we're getting ready for the, let's call it the funding demo. All, all funding goes down in a way when you get to start off the ground, you have an idea, you produce a prototype, and you need to sell it. Meaning someone needs to believe that what you do works and makes sense. And so this is after I've been on my own for a few months, and uh, I want to explain to you the demo we ran. And we had COVID up, and this was actually working. Um, we had, so I went down to Gateway's headquarters in San Diego. Richard Leips, at that time an employee too, stayed at our office in San Jose. And we had, I had written enough of the infrastructure that I could take a live running application on one PC, have it all to midstream, transition over the internet and resume execution down in San Diego. This was quite a challenge in that gateways. Corporate security did everything they could to prevent anyone from, let's say, get in. And uh, so we had a little bit of a hassle with those guys, but in the end, I was able to have uh, Richard Lipes on the conference call with Ted Wake, the founder of Gateway. So I hand Ted Wake a laptop and say, okay, Ted, you just tell me when you want the app to come. And so, so Ted said, well, now would be good. So I tell Richard, let it fly. He had written, a spinning globe demo basically. It was a similar to the Amiga Ball, but it was a globe where it texture map surfaces and all of it. And within two or three seconds, the globe showed up on Ted White's laptop. He picked it up, walked into his office, and said, This is awesome. You guys, let's go make it happen. And that was essentially how we confronted it. So here, uh, Richard and I, not a particularly good picture of him, but we'll get to see his face in a second. Furniture is still not up, uh, but this is the night before the demo. We're working until about 11 o'clock and I get up uh, the next morning to take the 6 a.m. flight to San Diego. So anyone who's done startup companies know what this picture is like and how tired you are. And you just know that those 10 minutes where you have the CEOs, you know, focus on you is, is make a break time. So, so very exciting. So after we got the okay, buddy, let's, uh, let's make it happen. Uh, we decided um, on how the company was going to proceed. So it was going to be an R&D facility in the San Jose in the Bay Area down on Technology Drive, while the business development and sales marketing remained located in Gateways, the Hoyer, the headquarters in San Diego. Yeah, it's really hard to see the pictures. That's a pity. Maybe I love photos. So this is a photo out over the office space we got down to Technology Drive. So we had room for about 50. We never got to more than 20, but it was very substantial. So, yeah, I know you guys can't really see it. Um, so we've been moving in at that time. This is the server room. Before, it was a room without servers, but uh, philosophically, that's where it ended up. A big debate at the time, if any of you followed it. So, what about the core operating system? We had sort of decided that as much as the Amiga OS was neat on its own, there really wasn't any reason to reinvent we cast it in the context of a modern operating system. So we looked at a variety of things. The one that initially got an enormous amount of press was the EOS. That was the company founded by Jean-Louis Gasset, who had been the VP of sales at Apple. And we actually got quite far with them, and in many ways, the EOS was similar, or at least it was software was similar to the original Amiga. However, they had a completely unrealistic idea of how much money it was worth. The gateway essentially at some point said, ah, forget it. We're not going to talk to you. Then we moved on to QNX, which, quite frankly, in my book, is probably the most impressive, impressive embedded full blown OS. Even today, it's very capable. And as a little side note, Randall Jessup can introduce me to this 
back in the days when I was working at Westchester. So I was intimately familiar with QNX and the stability of, of its microkernel architecture, but QNX, as good as it was, QNX had an interesting problem when we talked to the gateway. QNX was used to selling copies like 1, 2, 10, and their price list stuck to have, you know, a thousand copies at the time. And I said, remember the phone call, and then the executive at Gateway at the time asked him, so how about if we buy a million? And then and QNX could just not get their head wrapped right around the price and had to be different if you bought a million, because they were just not in their universe of the accounts that we should be selling. So ultimately, we ended up with Linux. And so after, I'd say, a year, we abandoned everything on Windows and just went on into Linux and began hiring Linux kernel guys, and that became our uh, platform. So here is a couple of the different people myself. Uh, Richard Likes sitting in the middle. Richard was is an old friend of mine. Um, he's actually in many ways very much an Amiga style person at heart. He had written much of the microcode for the Project Reality, which became Nintendo 64. So it was a classical bit flinger in graphics. And, those who know what that means. It was really neat to have someone like that with me. And Jim Miller came from Apple, he had been head of UI at Apple. So already right out of the gate, we had built an awesome team in terms of getting things together. Second gentleman on the right, so Jim Miller, is playing Ward, which we have also had hired out of Apple. So these were the first four of the San Jose R&D team. So just a couple of pictures. Jim and I are talking about where people should go and where they should all sit. So let's talk about the platform. I'm, I'm going a little bit fast because we are running behind the plate. So if we talk about the platform, the community was probably rightfully so up in arms when Gateway took over. They could not make sense out of how come something as precious as the Amiga, Motorola-based, or at least PAL PC, how in the world can you guys talk about um, Intel x86 and all that sort of stuff that everyone considered that we did so we had a very hard time on this thing. So the community had a hard time accepting many of the high-level decisions that Gateway as a company wanted to make it to So originally, we were going to produce two different products. One was called Amiga Classic, which was essentially the AA Amiga, probably updated with the Hagar OS, uh, sometimes called Wolf OS. Uh, that got to a point that that was working, uh, but that was primarily independent of we did on the R&D team. We were focused on the next thing, the Amiga NG, uh, named after a Star Trek, so to speak. So that was in the beginning, x86 for the platform, Linux on the inside, um, and we leveraged gateways on purchasing power and got several IC companies to develop custom chips for graphics, media, MPEG, all the things that we thought would be critical to do a multimedia home center type thing. And so we had a variety of things lined up. The one that got most talk in the press was something that was called a Mr. Monster chip, the MMC, which was really a hybrid of a 64-bit CPU and a DSP chip for signal processing, primarily of audio and video, and rendering pipeline there um, by those day standards for orders of magnitude higher than what you could get. It's probably nothing special today, but that was a big, uh, excuse me, big thing. Um, there was a lot of talk about emulating the older apps, but as an engineer, I always find these conversations sort of difficult. Not only did you have a different system architecture, the different custom chips, CPU, all of it, what do you could really emulate at a different, as a, at a reasonable speed and performance was not clear to me, but that was on the list of things that I wanted us to do. So, uh, again, hard to see, but the R&D offices finally got built, and we, over a period of about six months, hired the core R&D team that built. And I'll talk to you. Towards the end, I'm going to tell you what we made, so you can see what it ended up being. And uh, so again, the office is actually very nice. I'm taking on by Richard's office and my other right. And uh, all the gateway boxes. That I always found the gateway boxes just fascinating. Just the conversation of having that much gateway gear. The number of people who walk in off the street when it's all the work Amiga, Amiga. We had people just walking by the books. Amiga's here? Oh, great. And then they came in. And I don't know how many people I gave hands and talked to. And just because they were so excited to think uh, that Amiga was being resurrected. So it's really, it was a fun time. Now here's the R&D team in its entirety. 
Uh, and so you can see, we actually got off the ground. Uh, we hired many people, and so over a period of two years, a variety of things were developed, and I'll talk to you about what those were in a minute. So, so the other half of the conversation was, the R&D team was in San Jose, I ran that. Then there was the sales and marketing team. And they tended to get, let's call it the press, because they had access to PR at Gateway. Several of them were already executives at Gateway, so they were well connected. And so a lot of the, if you go Googling and Egan Gateway, these are the names you'll see, even though they really, in a, in a very real sense, were not super instrumental in putting any of the pieces together, but they were instrumental in having the conversations about what Gateway was. So Jeff Schindler, I'll show you some photos you can call us. I came as the CTO from Gateway, became our president, Tom Schmidt, Bill McEwen, that many of you know, Lake Rick Lafayette and David Curtis, each had a history that were very significant, and I'll, I'll talk about specifically David Curtis in a moment, um, and said, wait, I really consider him a sponsor of the project. He was just always interested, and to me, still is remarkable that someone like me, really, a hick in San Jose, could call the CEO of a Fortune 500 company and say, so Ted, here's what we're thinking. Do you, what do you think? And he would more often than not have an opinion that makes sense. So, so he was definitely in. He really liked the idea and he excited the customer base. Photos are hard to see because even the originals, but that is Rick with Faith, Lisa, and Jeff Shinto. I have a better photo of Jeff. <coughs> Excuse me. The heart and soul of the reborn Amiga was Jeff Shinto. He's the one who got it off the ground. He's the one who said, wait, hired. Uh, he was already hired. He was the one. Ted Wade asked to go make it happen. So a lot of the original Sioux City team were all pulled together by Joe Schindler. I think a lot of it is to his credit. Here's Rick Fade again, Tom Schmidt, who became our CEO, and Greg Ricker, who was the fifth employee on the R&D team, the Linux Chrome guy. And, uh, and so here, I, since I couldn't, didn't have my any good photos, I thought I'd show some other Jim Collis up top. Bill McEwen down in the bottom, and the gentleman over on the right uh, didn't get much attention at all. David Curtis, you'll understand why this is important. Uh, I know more than one of us here is a gray beard, and uh, David worked for OMG and was the lead on the internet version of Corbin, and you'll understand why that actually makes sense. So David was in charge of the services piece of the infrastructure we built, because we weren't just thinking about client devices like an Amiga replacement. We were thinking about this as a vehicle for delivering services that could get invoiced, and David was responsible for the service piece, the invoicing piece. He never really got to hire a team, so I think that ended up just being David. Uh, but David Curtis was, in my conversation, with him, instrumental in framing how we thought about uh, the product. So what did we make? And this is, I just went back to all the patents we got on various things. So this is sort of the highlights out of the patent portfolio that came out of the video. Um, number one is a virtual appliance infrastructure with the ability to live migrate applications. Those of you who have looked at VMware and these sorts of things today, this is not new now, but this was remarkably different back in the late 90s. And we did it without needing at host level virtual machines such as ESX. Uh, so this was done client-based without an enormous amount of heavy duty using the, essentially that base object that I talked about in the beginning that was all networkable. So I, was, I managed to essentially grab hold of an application from below, capture its content, and move the address space and all the pieces that went with it from device to device. That was piece number one. Uh, piece number two is, I call it a virtual machine, but it's really a little bit lighter than the typical DAVM. But it had the notion of figuring out at compile time what were the pieces that I needed to know about when I were to, to live my great here. The distributed object infrastructure, and finally the two last things. I actually think we have a patent on what's called in-app purchasing these days. We just call it microtransactions. The whole mindset of the Amiga, this is how we thought about it was, I want to be able to have a device that if I sit at home and I'm watching a video and I want to do something related to that video, I have to be able to make the purchase right here. So I think Gateway understood the making people buy stuff easily equation that I probably personally didn't appreciate. So we built it around the commerce model. And in that sense, I think Amiga and G here really in many ways were way ahead of its time. And if it hadn't been for what I'm going to talk about next, 
I really think this could have had a very good chance of going. I'm just showing this picture because this is uh, Jeff Schindler, where you can actually see his face a little bit. He was very keen in getting this off the ground. So, uh, on the concluding slide is, so what happened? Uh, those of you who were around in the days know that the dot-com bust, or bubble, or whatever you call it, was not always uh, pleasant. And Gateway was probably one of the first victims of it in its time. Not only had Dell begun making their life incredibly difficult by on-demand, uh, manufacturing, Gateway's pricing model and the way they operated meant that they had a financially hard time. So they decided that what they really wanted to do was to consolidate all their farm form operations in a few places. And so they wanted the R&D team to leave Silicon Valley and Mount Turbine, which of course we didn't want to do. So much to their surprise, everyone just said, well, that's fine, see ya. And then they ended up with empty offices. And that, I don't think it happened expected, but in reality, Silicon Valley, you know, we're not going to move to Irvine unless you're convinced it makes sense at that time, that we really didn't. So, so in some sad way, uh, I, we got to the point where this was working. We could line migrate complex apps from one system to another across OSs, even though many of the technologies that we nowadays associate with those sort of functionality didn't exist. And, and so the use case was a simple one. You know, Junior sits down in the living room, plays a game on the TV. He wants to go upstairs and finish on his computer because now you know, there's a football game on. This is a perfect example of the live migration. You want to take the live running game off the set-top box. You want to migrate it to the PC upstairs. And you want to have it just sit and pause and then continue when you get upstairs. So the live migration in that context, and from Gateway's perspective, I want to be the home hub of everything. Make a uh, unfortunately, we didn't really get to ship any of it, other than the few bits of evidence in the Gateway country stores, as they call it, where you can see some of this, uh, it never really got shipped in a meaningful, meaningful way. So, I think that's the end of it. So, I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Please. So, what happens to all the assets? So, it's so interesting. So, the Amiga assets, two things happened that I know of. The patents with my name on are still owned by Gateway, so they chose to sit on those. The Amiga IP um, from the old days, um, the majority of that has now expired. And it was from 83, 85, so that 17 year thing came up in roughly 2002. So what they really did was they licensed the trademarks and the right to use the brand name and I know there's more presentation on this. That went to a variety of Amigas, SCOMs, Amiga, whatever, depending on which country and whatnot, you can slice and dice. Please. And what about the new assets? The new, the stuff we built here? Yeah, yeah. I, quite frankly, I think Gateway took it in house, and what they did after that, they have or any help with it, so my guess is it sits in a box if it hasn't been thrown out. Okay, I guess that's the okay. case. I, 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 I think, I mean, if they had kept the R&T team together, I think it's, it's always, right as you're ready, we have all the pieces, we have a 20-man team, we have the first release. Uh, I, I think they just didn't know what to do with it. Um, I mean, this is, com anyone who's done operating system or something similar to operating system, there is a very steep learning curve. And this really is why it's not an operating system, it's low level enough that the complexity of figuring it out on your own makes it nearly impossible. So I think Gateway gave up. And we have to remember that the typical engineering employee at Gateway was concerned about whether the vessel should be gray or tan, right? That's the types of engineers they have. They did thermal stuff, Intel designed their motherboards, ICS, their clock tips, you know, it's, uh, they were not used to engineering in, in the Amiga sense, and that's what I've talked about here. Any, any other questions? Please, yeah. I remember in the, uh, the Amiga press, that 
So the question was, at the time, there was also talk in the press about the Tao system and all of those varieties. Towards the end, Bill McEwen, uh, who actually became a very good friend of mine, was looking at a variety of ways of taking this over. And one of the, and there was a variety of conversations with both the mobile, because you need an original legal operating system, not really this, but the original IP. Still in my book, is probably some of the best written software I've ever seen. I know of no one else who can write the kernel in 18K. This is kilobytes, not megabytes and gigabytes. But this is so light and so efficient by today's standards that it's perfectly suited for many of the embedded devices. It didn't seem obvious to many of us back in the late 90s that this was better and tighter than almost anything you could find. So I know that Bill McEwen thought that there would be customers for it in the mobile space. So, I also know that so many different hands were trying to get their fingers in the, in the pots, and I think that polluted the message of evidence, and it made it very difficult to understand what was real, because there was a large number of people who thought they were speaking on behalf of Amiga, when in reality, it was Gateway who owned it. So Gateway could speak for Amiga, but because a vendor in Germany, I mean, Hagen, Hagen's great example of Phase 5, had great products, that they just named, they branded themselves as Amiga something, but that didn't mean they spoke for Amiga, and I think it left the community in a great amount of confusion. Thanks. Yeah, talking about this 18K type of kernel. Yes. You're talking about the Linux kernel. No, the 18K kernel, I mentioned that is exactly the original Amiga. That stands out in my book as probably right, the best. It, it was just a personal. I don't think I've ever seen anything written about it. In my book, it's the best piece of software I've ever seen. So, yeah, I've seen it written by now. So, it sort of stands out as something to model. But that's slightly unrelated, but I'm just very impressed, even today. So. Okay, and anything else? No, I, I mean, I'll be around, so you're welcome to come up and ask. I think we should let the next speaker come up then.